It just had a, it was such a nice, wasn't it like that? Just a nice sort of relaxing melody. Anyway, I was back there like, does he sing to you like this? Because CA's wife is back there. Does he sing to you like this? She says, oh, I asked him to sing me this song. <laughs> Beautiful. Did you have a good day today? Yeah, I had a great day. I, I went for a run here, a 10 mile run all around, is this, what's this little town here? Thompsonville? I ran every single street in Thompsonville. And then I ran back to Three Abien. And then I ran back to Thompsonville and ran every single street again and then ran back home. So I had a good day, felt really nice, drove down to Carbondale and had uh, lunch with a former Arise student and a good friend of mine, Dee. And the day was just going absolutely stellar until I got back here and 15 seconds from where I'm sleeping, I hit a deer. Oh. Right here, right here on campus. And I, the moment I hit it, I thought, oh no, this is the Lord rebuking me for, for telling the world that my wife got a speeding ticket the other night. <laughs> and... Um, so the moment I hit it, I thought, oh, no, I've, I've killed this beautiful animal. Just as the Sabbath was coming, and it was brrr, rolling down the middle of the road. I wasn't going too fast, sort of 25, but you, I mean, if you hit me with a car going 25, it's not going to be pretty. So I was like, oh, no, I, I hurt this deer. So I pulled off the road. It's raining right now, as you know, but for those that are viewing, don't know that. So I pull off the road here. Is that a good idea or a bad idea in southern Illinois to pull off the road? That was a bad idea because I, I just went brrr. <laughs> but the, good, the bad news is I got the car stuck, and I want to thank Don for getting me out. But the good news is, is that I went looking for the deer, and he was gone. So he either just had a little tumble and ran away, or the Lord resurrected him. But uh, either way, I, it was a, not the way I wanted to begin the Sabbath. But now that I'm here with you, I'm very happy to be here. And so without further ado, I'm just going to have a quick prayer here, and we're going to continue through our study of the unknown God. And we're going through methodically. Are we going through a little slowly? Somebody said to me just the other day, they said, you know, David Asherick is getting old because he's slowing down. Now, I take a little offense at that, I have to tell you. That doesn't sit with me. So we might go like on hyperdrive tonight just to prove that I'm not getting... I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to be here this evening and the precious Sabbath hours are upon us. And Father, as C.A. has sung, it's so true. We want to tell the world that we are Christians, followers of the Christ. And Father, we're seeking to understand better who you are and who Christ is, and particularly in the context of this series, who the Spirit is. And so, Father, be with us as we seek to know the unknown God, the God that is at some level absolutely mysterious to us. Father, we know so little about your nature. We know a great deal about your character, but your nature is necessarily and inherently mysterious to us. So, Father, help us to recognize the limits of human intellect, the limits of human language, but let us come to Scripture and let us claim that Bible promise that the things that are revealed are for us and our children, but the things that are not revealed are for you. They're secrets to us. And so, Father, tonight we don't want to guess, we don't want to conjecture, we don't want to imagine, we just want to stand on a plane, thus saith the Lord. So help us to do that this evening. As we open Scripture, we would ask that you would come and open our hearts. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Well, our final passage that we looked at last night was John chapter 8, verse 58, where Jesus made this audacious claim when He was in the sort of discussion slash argument with the religious leaders of His day, and He said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he was glad when he saw my day. And of course, the religious leaders of Jesus' day responded by saying, how could you have seen Abraham's day? You're not even 50 years old. And Jesus responded with these words, absolutely stupendous words. He said, before Abraham was, and then what did he say? I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And this is an unambiguous reference to the very name of God in the Old Testament when Moses was standing there at the burning bush and Moses uh, was told by God to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses protested and said, who shall I say sent me? And he said, I am what? I am that I am. And, and that word there is haya. That's the, the, the Hebrew word haya. Sounds a little like a karate chop, doesn't it? Haya. But it means it's the present perfect uh, uh, tense of the verb to be. I exist. Literally, I exist. And that's why it's rendered in the English, I am. 
When we get to the book of Revelation, we find this very same kind of language, I am he that was and who is and who is to come. Someone has said that all of us say, I am becoming, right? We're in the state of becoming something, but only God can say, I am. He is not becoming a thing. He is what He always has been and always will be. And so when Jesus was there standing before the religious leaders of His day, and He had the temerity, the audacity to say, before Abraham was, I am, the religious leaders understood exactly what Jesus is saying. He was saying, I am the God of the Old Testament. That's me. I'm, I'm Yahweh. I am the God that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. We know that they understood that because the very next verse in verse 59 says that they picked up stones for their rock collection. What was it for? They were going to stone him. They understood perfectly well what Jesus was saying. And we looked at a verse just three chapters earlier that, than that in John chapter 5 where Jesus says, my father is working and I am working. And the Jews took significant umbrage at this, the, the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day, and they said, whoa, 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 whoa. You call God your father? You better be careful with that because when you call God your father, you make yourself, does anyone remember this? Equal with God. You are making yourself equal with God. Now, what we're beginning to see here in the passages that we've looked at, John 1 and Matthew 3, Matthew 28, John 8, John 5, is that there is singularity and plurality within the context of the Godhead. We, we began in the Old Testament, and I would ask you a question here. In the Old Testament, is the Trinity communicated explicitly? No, it's hinted at, it's suggested. In fact, I said that yesterday, you might remember. What's suggestive in the Old Testament becomes increasingly clear and determinative in the New Testament, and we'll see how clear it does become. But the point is basically this. In the Old Testament, we find elements of singularity, and we find elements of plurality. Now, when we come to the New Testament, we find Jesus saying things like, I, we did this yesterday, I and my what? Father, so that's two entities, right? I, there's an entity, and my Father, there's another entity, are what? One. So the two are one. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, there's an entity, and the Word was with God. The word with communicates adjacency. I'm here, you're there. Adjacency. So in the beginning was the and the Word was with God or adjacent to God, and here it comes, and the Word was God. So do we see singularity there? And do we see plurality there? We see both. We see both. Now, just a word on that. I was holding up these books yesterday, and I had somebody uh, send a question. I said, what are those books that he keeps holding up? The first I've already mentioned is the book uh, just titled simply The Trinity by Woodrow Whidden, Jerry Moon, John W. Reeve, published by Review and Herald Publishing. Very good. A great introduction, both theological and historical, to this teaching on the singularity and plurality of God. And the other book is a, just a little light reading, 900 pages worth of light reading, um, written by a friend of mine, Glenn Parfit. He's an Australian. It's titled, The Trinity, What Has God Revealed? Two excellent books, uh, resources that, that uh, I certainly recommend. In fact, I think I'm going to be quoting from this one a little bit later um, this evening. We quoted from this one yesterday. Now, we've looked at several passages in the Gospels. What I want to do now is look at several passages triadic passages in the epistles of Paul, passages in which that which is suggested in the Old Testament and which becomes clear in the Gospels becomes clearer still in the epistles of Paul. And we're just going to look at several of these. Many of them, frankly, require very little comment because they're just so plain in and of themselves. But let's go first to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And while I'm turning there, I'm going to ask you, how many of you saw Dr. Stefanovich's program last night? I thought it was superb. I thought the good doctor did a marvelous job. And much of what he said, we're going to sort of look at again today. Some of what he discussed, we won't be looking at. But there's a few little things that he brought out last night that I thought, man, that's good stuff. I want to re-mention that in my program here. So we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to read here verses 13 and 14. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 13 and 14. It says, but we are bound to give thanks to who? To God, always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the what? By the Spirit and belief in the truth. So here we have God has called, 
right? And through the sanctification of the Spirit. Now look at verse 14. To which He called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord, who? Jesus Christ. So here in this passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, do we see God the Father there? Yes or no? Do we see the Spirit there? Yes, the sanctification of the Spirit. And do we see the gospel of Jesus Christ there? Okay, so this is what is referred to as a triadic reference, a triadic reference, a passage in which we see in very close proximity the Father, the Spirit, and the Son, right? The Father, the Spirit, and the Son. And in this passage, it's expressly clear that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit each have a specific role to play in regards to the plan of salvation, you follow that, everyone? And we're going to talk about that in just a moment here. But let's look at another passage, 2 Thess- or Second Corinthians, pardon me, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This is sometimes referred to as the apostolic benediction, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the what? Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Okay, question. Do we see Jesus Christ in this passage? Do we see God in this passage? And do we see the Holy Spirit? There's a word, there's something I want you to note here, by the way. So this is clearly a triadic passage. This is the benediction here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit. But notice this language here, the communion, and some of your translations might say the fellowship of the Holy Spirit the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to ask you a question. Can I have fellowship with a piece of plastic? Oh, I just had such a great time fellowshipping with the pulpit. I had a great time fellowshipping with the piano. How you been? You like it up here? This is a good place to be, isn't it? It's just, man, you're quiet tonight. You, know, you see, it's very difficult to fellowship with a thing in order to actually fellowship, to interact. The Spirit would have to be a person, Are you with me on that? The fellowship of the Spirit, the fellowship belonging to the Spirit. And so we have Jesus, we have the Father, and we have the Spirit. Another unequivocal, unambiguous, triadic reference. Let me show you another one. Stay in Corinthians, but go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to note here verses 4 to 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. Speaking of... The spiritual gifts, this is one of the three lists of spiritual gifts found in Scripture, the other in Ephesians 4 and Romans 12, of course. Uh, Here it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, but the same what? Spirit. Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same. Okay, do you see the triadic reference there? Verse 4, the same Spirit. Verse 5, the same Lord. Verse 6, the same God. This is a passage that to me is very suggestive of the passage that we saw in Numbers chapter 6 where it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you, etc. We see these sort of triadic elements in in the Old Testament. We're seeing them here in the New Testament. They're more suggestive in the Old Testament, more explicit in the New Testament. But in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah goes into the temple, what are the angels crying out? What are they crying out? Holy, holy, holy. And so here, in the dispensation of the gifts, Paul says it expressly, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, there's one. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord, there's two, the Lord Jesus. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. This is a classic parallelism. One Spirit, one Lord, one God. Another unambiguous triadic reference. Does everyone see that? Yes or no? Now, here's a very interesting thing. Well, I'll get to that in just a second. I'm going to come back to that idea of why three, why the significance of three. Come with me now to the book of Hebrews. Stay in the New Testament. In fact, we're going to spend, I think, all of our time tonight in the New Testament. And uh, I remember a conversation that I had with a Jehovah's Witness, oh, probably five or six years ago. And I want to go on record as saying that some of the most sincere and wonderful people that I have met are Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, when I meet somebody who says that they're a Jehovah's Witness, I always say, whoa, what a coincidence. I too am a witness for Jehovah. And they're like, 
I'm like, yeah, I'm a witness for Jehovah. You're a Jehovah's witness. I'm a witness for Jehovah. It's a great conversation starter. By the way, when I meet my friends, the Mormons, and they say, oh, I'm a Mormon, and I just came through the Salt Lake City airport here, and there are, I mean, they're just like streaming out of there. So when I have the opportunity to interact with a Mormon, they say, oh, I'm a Latter-day Saint. I say, oh, coincidence of coincidences, I too am a Latter-day Saint. Aren't you? Absolutely. They're like, really? What, what? And then it just gets fun from there, okay? But the point is basically this. I was sitting with a plane, on the plane, not with a plane. There I am fellowshipping with pulpits and pianos again. I was sitting on a plane with my friend, uh, a, a person that I just met actually, who was a Jehovah's Witness, and I said, hey, I got a question for you. And uh, he had noticed that I was reading from the Bible, and so we struck up a conversation, and he had told me that he was a Jehovah's Witness, and he began sort of the uh, classic thing, you know, Jesus is, you know, not the God, He is a God. And, and I said, hey, can I ask you a question? I took him to Hebrews chapter 1. Now, in Hebrews chapter 1, we have here, I'm just going to kind of begin at the beginning, um, which is a good place to begin, obviously. Verse 1, it says, God who at various times and in various ways spoken uh, spoken times past to uh, the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by who? His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, who, being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as He by inheritance has obtained a more excellent name than they have. And so the author of Hebrews begins by saying, God spoke by the prophets in the past, but now He has spoken by His Son, and His Son, when He had expunged our sins, sat down at the right hand of God, and He was given a name that is better than any name that was ever given to an angel. By the way, do you know what that name is? The name is Son. The, the, the Son. He's called the Son, the Son of God. Now check this out in verse 5. For to which of the angels did He... Now who is He there? God the Father. Very good. For to which of the angels did he, God the Father, ever say? And this is what I was going through with my friend there on the plane. I said, okay, now who's he? Help me to understand who's he. And he said, well, that's God. I said, okay, we agree. For to which of the angels did he ever say, and then he quotes here from one of the Psalms, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So you see he's asking a, a question here, a, a hypothetical question. To whom did he ever say, you're my son, today I have begotten you? He's trying to show the elevation of Christ over angels. Verse 6, but when he, here's our pronoun again, singular masculine pronoun, who is he here? Once again, same, ex very good, it's God the Father. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So he's trying to show the superiority of Jesus over the angels because Jesus doesn't worship the angels. The angels worship Jesus. Verse 7, and of the angels, he says, now question again, who's he? Still God. Our, our, our pronouns are being consistent here, right? It's always the Father. Uh, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels... Uh, spirits and his ministers of flame of fire. Now look at verse 8. But to the Son, he says, okay, I'm going to ask again, and forgive me for being so, so um, um, consistent with this, but who is he in verse 8? To the Son, he says. God, watch this. To the Son, God the Father says, quote, your throne, what are the next two words? Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Now, this is a very interesting thing. Here you have God the Father calling Jesus the Son. What's He calling Him? God. God in the most emphatic and absolute sense. So here's, a, here's the question. As I was going through with my friend, I said, okay, who's he? And he says, that's God the Father. I said, who's he in verse 5? That's God the Father. Who's he in verse 6? That's God the Father. Who's he in verse 7? That's God the Father. I said, who is he in verse 8? That's God the Father. And I said, now I have a question. Here's God the Father speaking to the Son, Jesus, and he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And he went, I'll have to study that out. I said, yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious. What do you think of that? Beloved, the point is this. If God the Father is comfortable calling Jesus God in the most absolute and emphatic sense of the word God, we can be comfortable calling Him God. Amen? Now, that gets us back to our point that we were making earlier. Question, is God the Father God? So there's an entity. 
Is God the Son called God? So there's an entity, but they're both God. And so what do we see? Singularity, but we also see plurality, okay? Now, someone is bound to say, well, that's a contradiction. That is inherently contradictory. Au contraire, mon frere. It is not a contradiction. A contradiction only actualizes. Now, forgive me here for just giving a little lesson here on how contradictions actually work. You only have an actual contradiction if you affirm the same thing in the same way as both true and not true. A contradiction only arises when you have a violation of what's called the law of non-contradiction, okay? The law of non-contradiction says that a statement cannot be true and false in the same way at the same time. So if we were saying there are three gods and there is one God, and we meant God in the same sense, that would be contradictory, but that's not what we're saying. We're saying there are three persons. Three what, everyone? Three persons who make up one what? God. Okay, so if you take my wife and I, because the two become one flesh, two people become one family. You tracking with me? Is that a contradiction? It's not. But if we said two people become one people, one person, would that be a contradiction? That would be a contradiction because it's trying to affirm and deny the same thing in the same way. It's a violation of the law of non-contradiction. The statement becomes incoherent and therefore contradictory. The Trinity is not incoherent. Some people will say, That's, it's, it's illogical, it's irrational, it doesn't make any sense. You're saying God is three and God is one. Yes, but we're not saying that God is three in the same sense that He is one. He is one in the sense that He is one God. He is three in the sense that that one God is comprised of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You tracking with me? Now, as Dr. Stefanovich said on the program last night, and I want to repeat this, the Bible nowhere explains this. Okay, the Bible is not a systematic the theology. In fact, there's just a few books, there's only a few books in all of Scripture that could be considered systematic in a theological sense, one of which, of course, is many of the epistles of Paul, for example, in Romans, etc. So, you're not going to find any systematic treatment of the Trinity, trying to explain the threeness and the oneness, and try you don't find it. What you find is an affirmation that there is only one God, and you find an affirmation that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's up to us as Bible students and as theologians and as scholars um, to try and understand it. But the point is this, whether or not we can understand it does not prevent us from proclaiming it. Are you with me on that? Some people will say, oh, I can't proclaim that. I, ca I can't proclaim that because I don't understand it. <laughs> Good luck proclaiming anything in Scripture. Do you understand how God, the infinite, illimitable, eternal God of the universe, becomes a man? Does anyone understand that? How does God become a six-foot-tall man who walks around, who has to walk from Jericho to Galilee and from Galilee to, to Jerusalem? Do you understand that? Can anyone in this room explain how God becomes a man? Let's take it a step further. God died on a cross. The man Jesus Christ died on a cross. Can anyone explain that here? But do we proclaim that? Do we, is it, do we preach that? That's the gospel, beloved, the life, death, and resurrection of the man Jesus Christ who was, in fact, the incarnate God. So if somebody says, well, I can't, if I can't explain it, I can't proclaim it. I can't believe it. Well, good luck with anything in Christianity, right? The point is this. We are not affirming something that is incoherent or irrational. What we're simply saying is that God, or pardon me, Scripture affirms that God is one, but then Scripture also affirms that God is Father, God is Son, and God is Holy Spirit. Amen? Come with me to the book of Revelation for another unambiguous triadic passage, Revelation chapter 1. In fact, this is how the book of Revelation opens up. Revelation chapter 1, and we'll pick it up in verse 4. Right at the outset, Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia... Grace to you and peace from... Now, this is most scholars believe, virtually every scholar of Revelation believes that this next passage here is a New Testament way of saying, I am, haya from the Old Testament. Verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who what? Is and who was and who is to come. In other words, from the I am. 
Grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before His throne. Okay? So here you have God. Here you have the seven spirits, which is a, which is a book of Revelation way of saying the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits that are before His throne. They show up in Revelation 4 and 5 as well. Verse 5 says, and from who? Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. So, in verse 4, you basically have this greeting, greeting to you from God, I am, who was and who is and who is to come, and from the seven spirits, which is the book of Revelation way of saying the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ. Now, let's take it even a step further in the book of Revelation. To me, this is absolutely fascinating. A major motif in the book of Revelation is what has been called the counterfeit motif. The what motif, everyone? The counterfeit motif. Okay, what do we mean by that, the counterfeit motif? Well, what we find is that when God does something, Satan counterfeits it, right? Uh, Just the other day, I was in a grocery store here, and someone paid with a $100 bill, and the, the the cashier was holding up the $100 bill looking for that little strip that runs through. He was looking for it. Okay, he's looking for it because a counterfeit is going to look similar to, but not identical to the real thing. You will never see a counterfeit $57 bill or a counterfeit $29 bill or a counterfeit $33. Why? Because there's no original. There's no original, so there's no point in counterfeiting. What we find in the book of Revelation is that God has a church, Revelation chapter 12, a pure church, clothed with the moon and the sun, or clothed with the stars and the sun, the moon under her feet. That's God's true church. But then in Revelation chapter 17, there's a counterfeit. There's a fallen church, a false church, who's bedecked with all of these jewels and is drunk with the blood of the saints. And so God has a church. Here's a counterfeit. In the book of Revelation, God has a city. What is God's city in the book of Revelation? The new Jerusalem. Does Satan have a city in the book of Revelation? What's the city? The, okay, Babylon, very good. In fa- there's others as well. God has a message in the book of Revelation, the three angels' messages, and Satan has a message in the book of Revelation as the, the uh, demons that with the, the frogs that look like frogs go out to bring their message. Very interesting. Um, you have this counterfeit motif. God has a thing. Satan has a thing. Counterfeiting counterfeiting. He sees aping. God does this, He does this. Now, here's a fascinating thing. When we get to the latter half, the latter part of the book of Revelation, beginning in, say, chapter 12, chapter 12 down to chapter 22, really chapter 20, from 12 to 20, you have three primary figures who are warring against God's people. Three primary figures who are warring against God's people. The first one we're introduced to in Revelation chapter 12, he's called the dragon. Okay, who is it, everyone? The dragon. Now, the very interesting thing about the dragon is that when we're introduced to the dragon, he has a kind of preeminent role, an almost authoritative role over the other two. The dragon, according to Revelation chapter 12, makes war with the last, the remnant of God's people on earth. He's making war. Now, that's how Revelation chapter 12 ends. Verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Now, the next chapter, chapter 13, tells us how he's going to make war. What vehicle is he going to use, or vehicles? And two beasts come up out of the uh, come up in in succession in Revelation 13. So don't miss that. Revelation 12, the dragon's going to make war. Revelation 13, this is how. And right at the very beginning, it's fascinating. Right at the beginning, Revelation chapter 13, this first beast comes up. He has the body of a, a leopard and the mouth of a lion and all of this. And it's very interesting what the scripture says. The scripture says the dragon gave this first beast that comes up out of the sea his power, his throne, and his great authority. Well, why is the dragon giving his power, throne, and great authority to this beast? Why is he doing that? Because this is the means through which he's making war against the remnant, making war against the people of God. This beast comes up, and I don't have time to go into it right now, but I can give you the, uh, I can let you know, how many of you have heard a sermon that I've preached called, Does Jesus Christ Have a Twin? Has anyone heard that? I think they've only played it like 50 million times on 3ABN. Okay, so the point is this. What you find in Revelation chapter 13 is that this first beast apes what Jesus does. Jesus was baptized and began his mission, comes out of the water. This beast rises out of the water, begins his mission. Jesus was resurrected, uh, was lived, was uh, was slain and then resurrected. This beast was slain and then 
received a deadly wound, and then it was healed. Jesus reigned uh, or, or ministered for three and a half years. This beast reigns for 42 months. You just have this controversy or this uh, 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 counterfeit motif. It's well documented that the actual term here that's used by John in other passages um, for this beast is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist, it's well documented, is basically trying to take the place of Christ, trying to receive the the position and preeminence of Christ. Now, don't miss that. The dragon, who's sort of the the uh, overseer, the supervisor of the whole project, he gives his power, throne, and great authority to this first beast who is a counterfeit of Jesus. Now, the fascinating thing is, is that when this beast receives the deadly wound in verse, uh, in verse 3, but when he goes down, he that leads into captivity will, will go into captivity. He that kills with the sword will be killed with the sword in verse 10. In verse 11, another beast starts to come up, and this beast comes up out of the earth. And here's the fascinating thing. The second beast, the earth beast, is essentially an apologist or a spokesperson for the first beast. And what this, first, what this second beast does is absolutely remarkable. He calls down fire from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That is the, that's what the Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit brought fire down on the day of Pentecost, and, so, and there's many other passages we could go to. But this beast is also referred to as the false prophet. Now, here's the fascinating thing. When we come to the book of Revelation, which is uh, saturated with this counterfeit motif, what do we encounter? We encounter a supervising figure, the dragon, who gives his power, throne, and great authority to represent him on earth, the first beast, who, when he goes down, turns his authority over to, and and the the sort of uh, uh, PR person, public relations person, is the second beast. Counterfeit of the Father, counterfeit of the Son, counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. Now, think about that for just a moment. Is this not one of the most profoundly persuasive arguments that there must be a real trinity if Satan is counterfeiting it in the, in the book of Revelation? Think that through, right? Why would you make a counterfeit of a thing that there wasn't an original article of? But when we come to uh, Revelation 12 to 20, what do we see? The dragon making war, the first beast, the antichrist beast making war, and the second beast, the land beast making war. Counterfeit of the Father, counterfeit of the Son, counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you that there's a Father, there's a Son, and there's a Holy Spirit. You with me on that? Powerful. Powerful. Now, let me take you to what for me is the single most persuasive evidence in all of Scripture that God is in fact triune. And it's three words long. It's found in 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16. Three simple words. It's where John says, God is love. God is love. John here gives us a grammatical equivalence. God is this thing. John does not make the far more modest claim that God is loving. Loving. How many of us in this room are loving? I mean, at times, right? I am. My wife would tell you that. She'd say he's a loving husband. So you could say David Asherick is a loving husband, or even with my children, my two boys, Landon and Jabel. You might see me fishing with them or, or out in the woods backpacking with them, and you might say, oh, he's a good dad. He's, he loves his children. He's a loving father. So it would be totally grammatically and uh, experientially correct to say David Asherick is loving. It would be the same, I'm sure, for, for all of you as well. We have instances of loving. Now, we're not always loving. Sometimes we, we blow it. At least I do. Maybe you don't. But occasionally I become unloving. Now, here's the interesting thing. While you could say David Asherick is loving, do you know what you could not say? Ah, that's right. You could not say, oh, that David Asherick guy, he's love. No, 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 no. I'm not love. I'm loving. John could have made the far more modest claim. He could have simply said, God is loving, an adjective describing a behavior or an attribute of God. That's a very modest claim. But John doesn't make this modest claim, God is loving, an adjective describing a behavior. What he says is, in a grammatical equivalence, he says, God is the noun love. That is to say, something that is the essence of godness, what makes God God, is 
identical to what makes love, love. Now, this is awesome because when we go to the actual biblical definition of love rather than this soupy, sappy, warm, fuzzy, wuzzy love that's uh, basically just emotion or lust masquerading as love, but when we go to the biblical definition of love, love is not a feeling or an emotion or a, man, I just feel so good. It's not that. Love is a principle. Love is a what, everyone? Love is a principle, and that principle says, I'm going to put you and your needs, your wants, your dreams, your hopes, your desires, your visions in front of my own hopes, dreams, wants, desires, and visions, right? The Bible says it this way in the so-called love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, love seeks not its own, which raises the question. If love is not looking out for itself, oh, oh, the me monster, okay, who is it looking out for? It's looking out for others. Love seeks not its own. And so we can derive this very simple. Jesus said this. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his for his friends. Here's another one. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. So what we find in love is this other-centeredness, this no, 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 you have it. No, you take it, and not the disingenuous, no, 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 I'll pay for the meal, when really you're thinking, I hope he offers because I don't want to pay for the meal, right? True love is is a throwing yourself, an almost reckless, if I can use that word, an almost reckless throwing of yourself at the expense of others, or not at the expense, but for the benefit of others and at the expense of yourself. It's not what I want, it's what you want. How can I help you? In fact, we find this phrase, and I wish I had time to develop this, but Paul uses this phrase over and over and over and over again in his epistles. He uses this phrase that Jesus gave himself. If you study that phrase out in Paul's writings, he gave himself. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself. Be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Ephesians 5, 25, gave himself. He, who loved me, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For Paul, this phrase, gave himself, is, a, is an equivalence to love. So it's not this fuzzy, wuzzy, namby-pamby, air-conditioned, milk-toast vanilla version of love, you know, that you sing and you forget tomorrow or next year. Love is is a principle that says, you are more important to me than I am to me. Jesus gave himself. He gave himself. But here's a fascinating thing. In order to have love, if love is the principle of putting somebody else first, definitionally, you have to have another. Have to, right? you got to. You cannot have love in a vacuum. If love is, if you have a single solitary being, namely just God, who's all by himself in the most emphatic sense of one, this God could become loving if he made an object upon which to bestow his love. But listen to the language. He becomes loving. That's not what John said. John said, God is love. Something about God and the very fiber and fabric of who He is, is this principle of putting someone else first. But how can you put someone else first if there's no one else to put first? Now, I thought this was pretty clever. I was having this conversation with my friend Ty Gibson, and he said, well, let me take it a step further. I've got this amazing quotation. In fact, I think it's going to be here on the screen so you can read it. It's a little lengthy, but follow this. This is awesome. I hadn't thought of this. To me, what I was saying, I was like, yeah, but then, then Ty, he took it to the next level. Okay, watch this. Three is the essential numeric value of love. Where there is only one person, this is our point, love cannot occur. Where there are two, each is the sole recipient of the other's attention, giving place for self-absorption. But the moment there are three, each recipient of any one's love must also humbly defer attention to the third party, and each one is the third party to the other two. Pure selflessness can now occur by virtue of the fact that each one must love and be loved with both an exclusive 
and a divided interest. If God's essential identity is traceable to a solitary selfhood, which would be the case if Jesus in any sense had a point of beginning, and if the Holy Spirit does not eternally exist with distinct personhood, then love is not essential to God's nature. Said more simply, if Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not eternally coexistent, it cannot be said with any coherence that, what's our phrase? God is love. Now, do you follow that? That is awesome. What he's basically saying is, is that if there was just two you have the potential for a selfish self-absorption. And anyone who has ever seen two young people fall in love, they don't even have to be young. In fact, I had a friend of mine who recently just fell in love with a young lady, or I guess it was about a year ago, and these two were just ridiculous. And uh, listen, I'm, I'm all for young people falling in love with, with, godly, uh, with other godly young people, but they were just like, oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> and they're just, it's like, ah. I mean, okay, a little bit, I mean, a, a little bit of that's okay, but I mean, it was just like they were on their own little, ooh, and it was just like the rest of the world just disappears, right? And, and so now I don't want to get in any trouble. Please, please, please don't take offense at this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It is sometimes the case. Okay, I'm going to make you repeat that. It is sometimes the case. Did I say always? No. no. What did I say? It is sometimes the case that when you have a, a married couple who ha decides not to have children, okay, I have noticed in a pastoral setting and just as an observer of human beings that there is a tendency or a, a propensity for those couples to become isolationist and even a little selfish, right? So what does God say? What's the first thing that God says to Adam and Eve so that they won't sin there batting their eyelashes at, every, at each other all day? What does He say? Be fruitful and... And listen, I tell people this all the time. The change that happens in your life, I tell single people this, the change that happens in your life when you get married is, in my opinion, smaller than the change that happens in your life when you're married and you have kids. Are you with me on that? Because if you get married to it, you're 25 and you're traveling the world and whatever, and then you marry another 25-year-old who's traveling the world, now you're just two sort of selfish people gallivanting around the world, right, with one another. But, but now you bring a little pooping, crying, eating, whining thing into your life. You're like, hey. you, you, you do, and I, I don't know, right? You got this thing now. And now what you have is the opportunity, as soon as you have more than two, now you have the opportunity for, if I'm bestowing my love, for example, upon my wife, right? My son, right, in the, in the, in the context, and of course I have more than one, but in a familial setting, now my son has to be comfortable with being on the, not the outs, but with seeing my love lavished upon my wife. And, and, the, and the converse is also true. When I'm lavishing my love upon my son, my wife has to be... And so I, this is Ty's point when he says that three is the essential numeric value of love. Because if you have just two, you could have just a self-absorption. But you introduce a third party, and then now you really have the potential for someone to feel as though they were left out. But in the, in the triune nature of God, the Father lavishes His love upon the Spirit and the Son. The Son lavishes His love upon the Spirit and the Father. And the Spirit lavishes His love upon the Father and the Son. It's absolutely beautiful. And this is, I believe, the point that John was making when he said, not merely that God is loving, but that God is love. Now, one of my very favorite statements to this effect is from a, an evangelical theologian, uh, former president of the Evangelical Theological Society, a man by the name of Millard Erickson, wrote a book called Making Sense of the Trinity. Now, listen to this language. He says, if reality is fundamentally physical, if reality is fundamentally physical, then the primary force binding it together is electromagnetic. If, however, reality is fundamentally social, then the most powerful constituting force is that which binds persons together, namely love. Now, let me unpack that for you. In the non-theistic or atheistic world, people who don't believe that there is a God, they think that all there is is matter and energy. 
Everything that we see around us, from stages to pulpits to people to speakers, and everything that you see is made up of two constituent elements, matter and energy. That's it. At its most fundamental, rock-bottom level, reality is about matter and energy. And so Millard Erickson's point is a fascinating one. He says, if you're an atheist, if you're a non-theist, then if the, if, the, if the most fundamental truth about reality is that it, at the basic level we are made up of matter, then the most powerful constituting force in the universe is electromagnetism. That's what keeps things together, right? Some things come together like that, some things come together like this, some things come together like this. He says, but if reality at its most basic fundamental level is not matter but social, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the most basic truth, the most basic fundamental reality about the universe is that there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He says, ah, if reality is fundamentally social, then the most powerful constituting force, the thing which, which binds us together, is not merely electromagnetism, it's love. And friends, isn't that the world we live in? I mean, isn't that the world we live in? I mean, how many movies is Hollywood producing about the glory and the passion and the thrill of electromagnetism? <laughs> no. I mean, can you imagine? That's not the world we live in. Hollywood makes their money and their bread and butter and, and the, the magazines, the, the various magazines that people buy and the books that people buy and, and the stories that they read. What are they about? They're about love, they're about relationships, they're about, they're about overcoming, they're, I mean, just all of the, it's about love. We are wired for love, and Millard Erickson's point is a fascinating one, and it's the biblical point. The reason that you're wired for love is that the universe is wired for love. As a, as a fundamental reality, a fundamental extension, God created, God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, created all of these wonderful, beautiful, and in our case, sentient beings, and said, participate with me in my triune love. Participate with me. Love created. Lo in fact, I'll say something a little philosophical here, but you'll get this. Creation did not make God loving. God's love made creation. You got it? But if I believe that God is just rigidly singular, like my friends the Unitarians believe, right? If I don't believe in, a, in the triune nature of God, if I think that God is just one in the most emphatic sense of singularity, this God cannot be love. This is not the God of Scripture, because this God could only become loving once He made an object upon which to bestow His love. Oh, hmm. no, 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 no. What God does is amazing. What, what God is is amazing. He didn't create and then become loving. He created because He was love. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in their eternal counsels came together and said, this love that we have, this joy that we have, this happiness that we have, this beauty that we have, let's share it. Let's create others who will understand who we are. Let's create others who can participate with us in this beautiful thing. Let's create others and of course, there was a huge danger. I mean, that's a, that's a slippery slope because the moment that you create beings who are genuinely free, because love requires freedom, right? Then you create a risky universe, necessarily, because love requires freedom and freedom entails risk. But God said the risk is worth it. The risk is worth it. This is why the, the very three opening words of the Conflict of the Ages series written by Ellen White more than 100 years ago, the very first three words are, do you know? God is love. And then you go all the way through all of the volumes, patriarchs and prophets, prophets and kings, desire of ages, acts of the apostles, great controversy. And then you come to the very last three words. Do you know what those last three words are? God is love. Friends, we have, we have fully set the table now. In our final two presentations, we're going to go take a specific look at the person and the divinity of the Spirit. Who is the Spirit? Because if the Spirit is merely a power, I'm going to use Him. But if the Spirit is a person, then He's going to use me.